7.1 slightly later in the meeting, so we'll move on to section 7 just now. Application, um, item 7.1 is an application for planning permission at 525 Ferry Road, Edinburgh. Um, and I will hand over to planning officers to introduce myself. We'll cover that. The application site is located north of Edinburgh on Ferry Road, which is the Key Sandbrook Corridor. The building is the former data centre that has been vacant for over five years. Hello. Is there not an echo? Does anybody else get an echo? No, there's an echo coming back. Gentlemen, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, stop sharing. Just that one. GoPro, isn't it? Just for those of you on Teams, we're just trying to address the echo um, that we're getting. Um, won't be a moment. The application site is north of Edinburgh and very good, but the key sandbook corridor. The building is the former data centre that has been vacant for over five years. Around the side, we have fitted plain field to the east with a tree line boundary. To the south, we have um, Camingham Flat. Um, to the west, we have the Village Hotel uh, Gym. And across from the site to the north is the Leonardo Aerospace and Morrison Supermarket. With over 200 car parking spaces, including at the basement, the site has substantial areas of hard sanding. There are a number of trees within the site. The upper picture here shows that there's a situation for Group 1 trees, which sits on a high end retaining wall. The trees were originally planned to provide a separation between the existing use and the residential um, development to the south. Over time, the trees had um, provided a degree of property for the flat to the south. The proposal to demolish the office building <clears throat> and for the development of 256 flats ranging from one to three bedrooms. More than 20% of the three bedroom units will cater for growing families. 25% of the total units will be for affordable housing within Block F. and they will be 10 year blind. 70% of the affordable units will be for social rent and the remaining 30% for mid market rent. Within block E, e we have highlighted in purple. Four commercial units on the ground floor is proposed for a mix of use, including shops, professional services, businesses, and a restricted cafe use. A new public realm is proposed along Ferry Road with new pedestrian and cycle links. The wall on Ferry Road would be retained with alteration to its height. To provide a more active frontage and to strengthen the character on Ferry Road, there would be some tree removed. In terms of car parking, there would be three spaces for taxi drop off deliveries in connection to the commercial unit, and there would be one disabled parking bay. For the development design and layout, six spots would be centred around a high landscape courtyard with a network of paths at the ground level. The amenity provision within the site includes the public realm, shared communal, private communal and ground floor private garden. Further amenities for the residents include balconies and roof terraces. 
There will be a stud pond feature with an integrated boardwalk along to the east of the site. Further to the south will be um, additional stud pond features. Approximately 68% of the site area will be landscape with seeds and planting. That includes the planting of 111 new seeds. The development includes a new vehicle as created off Berry Wood. Vehicle movement within the site will be limited to the commercial unit uses and the residential parking within the basement. There would be no car parking within that, the landscape area. In terms of cycle parking, there would be 44 cycle parking, mostly Sheffield stands at the ground floor level. In terms of wider connectivity, a link between the village hotel to the west here is proposed and can be delivered up to the state boundary. A future link between the Kimmerheim estate to the southwest of the state is indicated, but whether this can be delivered is unclear due to land ownership. It could also potentially be constrained due to the proposed flood feature. However, the, link, the indicated link only demonstrates that how connectivity measures could be enhanced in the future. All paths within the landscape area are generally at a slope gentler than 120 to provide accessible routes. The development layout will retain the existing underground car parking, which will provide car parking spaces for 30% of the flat, doors for cycle parking and waste doors. The development will be a seven-storey high, where Block A to E will have a recessed rooftop. This slide here shows a cross-section of Block A, B and C to the existing residential development to the south. The property distance from the projecting balconies will be approximately 20 metres. Compared to the existing situation, there would be a change in the property level at the group two seeds, group one seeds would be removed altogether. However, considering that the seeds are within the application site and they're not in great health, there is a case for them to be removed. The height and the production of the proposed blocks will not result in an adverse loss of daylight to these flats. The proposal includes a simple pile of materials with different tones of bath and stone facing brick and aluminium cladding for the vista top stories. The tones of the brickwork will bring a variety and interest to the street edge and character to the individual building. The arrangement of the brickwork will have articulated detailing. The elevation details include projecting balconies, dual net balconies and wheel height glazing. The following slides will show what the development could look like post-completion. This slide here shows the before and after situation with the seeds removed and the view to the development from Kimmerham at this. In a certain application in line with Natural Planning Framework 4 and Edinburgh Local de Development Plan, these are the key considerations. The proposal is for sustainable redevelopment of a brown beer site that will contribute to local living and 20 minute neighbourhood. The development will not have an adverse impact on its grounding, including the setting of invalid conservation area and city skyline. The development design and layout, including the density of the development, is acceptable for this location. Neighbouring amenity will not be adversely affected and future occupiers will have feasible levels of living amenity within the development. The loss of the seed will be mitigated through a high quality landscaping design. Car and cycle parking will comply with the standard contained in the Edinburgh Design Guiding and the site is accessible to nearby public transport. The applicant has indicated a commitment to invest in two club cars. A legal agreement will be required to secure provision towards education and infrastructure, 25% affordable housing and two club cards. I recommend that this application be approved. Okay, committee, before we start with questions, we have got a request for a hearing. So, opening up to committee, thoughts on a hearing. Councillor Matt. Normally, um, I wouldn't. I understand there are some local concerns about this, about um, 
connectivity, um, which was partially addressed. I mean, I'm, I'm in the position that I've got questions and I'm not quite sure that they can be answered adequately by officers or whether we should go for a hearing at, at, at this stage, because it, it may be that they can be answered adequately by officers. It may be that I require further information and representation. So I'm sorry, I'm sitting on the fence on this one at this stage. Councillor B. <clears throat> I'm in a similar position. I still have uh, questions, but I hope that they can be answered by, by officers. So I would not be inclined to support a hearing on this one. I, I think, there, as I say, it's a complicated uh, application, um, but personally, I feel that I can, I can probably get enough information from the report and from questions. Councillor Jones. I actually support a hearing in this instance because I think it's a very large development. Um, there are concerns that I have, uh, and again, I'm not sure that I will get the answers from officers that um, perhaps um, I, I will need. So I would propose a hearing. Okay, I think then we're just going to do for and against. Councillor Gardner? No, if, if it's going to vote, that's fine. Okay, so there has been a, a request by um, a ward councillor for a hearing, and um, we can just take that vote for and against. So could I firstly take the votes for the hearing? For, sorry, for the hearing, yeah. Okay, that's five and against the hearing. That's six, so the application will be determined today. Moving on then, opening up two questions. Councillor Mowat, followed by Councillor Beale, and followed by Councillor Booth. Um, thank, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, I had a question about the height, um, and if you could just put that into context with surrounding areas. I know it said in the report that because of the site fronting onto Ferry Road, we can afford to have a higher height, but um, it does, in the images that were presented, look quite a lot higher than what is around it. So I wanted to get to grips with uh, what's what, what's the surrounding context? So that would be the Kingham Estate, which I can't say, um, and also the, the 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 recessed bits as well, because I wasn't quite clear if it was seven then recessed on top or six and recessed seventh. So if we could just look at the heights a bit more closely, please. Okay. <clears throat> Overall, the height is seven story high, but. Block A to um, yeah. and Block A to E, um, the the top story would be recess um, from the E, but overall the development height is um, seven story. Can I come back? Part of it was about what's what's the height of the estate of the Kingaham estate because it's I think everything else is quite low relationally, so it's the Kingaham which is higher. Next,
Okay, done. Um, so, um, to, we have the Village Hotel to the west, which is the five story, um, mostly five story. Um, and this place here showed the, the Cammingham development to the south, which ranges from um, six to seven story high, but there's a slight land level um, drop. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you've got the um, Ningado building here, which shows up with five stories across from the site. Does that answer your question? If you have it available, the AOD would be quite useful, just because I hadn't appreciated that there's actually quite a significant land level drop, which is... Um, uh, I don't have it on this... I don't have it on this time. I mean, doesn't... If we can go on to other questions and maybe have that produced at the end. OK, I think, I think we'll come back to that. So I've then got Councillor Bill, Councillor Booth, and I see Councillor Minch Nikin and Councillor Jones. Oh, and Councillor Matters Quayle. Thanks, Kavidia. My question was also about the height, because I don't see any specific measurements, just the numbers of storage, which doesn't really answer my question. Again, I don't know if that, that thing we just had on the screen, it's very hard to see. It wouldn't, again, just a bit more description of that would be, be helpful in terms of the other sides of the um, development as well. If you could, please, yeah, if thanks. We, if we can, I will need to go and dig out the drawings. So if we move on to the next question, and then we'll come back to the height. Okay, and if it could be emailed to us, that would be a So, so anybody who's got yeah, questions email. about the height of the building, can you park it for a moment? And then we'll come back to that. So I've got Councillor Booth. So Councillor Jones, yours is also about height as well. OK. Um, Councillors, uh, so Councillor Booth. Thanks, Amy. My question is about the combined consultation responses, which weren't available on the planning portal last night, but I see that they have been uploaded this morning. Unfortunately, they've been uploaded as a zip file, so they're not accessible. So I wonder if those consultation responses could be circulated by PDF or put on the planning portal, please. Um, yeah, I looked on the planning portal this morning and spotted that the PDFs weren't there. I went in and op uploaded the zip file and I was able to open them. But if there's a fault with yours, yeah, okay. Apologies, I tried to get that fixed. Um, bear with me in five minutes. Councillor Mies Benikin. Thank you, Convener. Um, my, my question, officers, you mentioned that um, the tree loss, I think you said, would be acceptable. Um, and I, I just, uh, in terms of... Um, um, Landscaping and, and, and climate mitigation measures. I was wondering if you could go into a, a bit more detail about replacements. Sorry. <clears throat> yes, of course. Um, Will there be a number of trees removed to facilitate the, um, the opening to um, very wood planted um, and also to provide a more active planted? Um, the trees that have been selected for removal um, are young mature, uh, young, mature trees, but they have been identified having um, an infection, so um, these are the trees being proposed for, move, for removal. Um, and also the tree to the south of the site, they um, are also in poor health, the, the group one tree, um, and they've been clattered cast through C. So in terms of looking at the existing situation where the site is heavily characterised by house standing, you know, the proposal is um, it's going to be landscapes that the... That the 38% with them a mixed up planting 111 new seed. So um, we have the condition for further details of the, the landscaping game input. So when you're looking at the definite and proposed game, um, there's more, biode more biodiverse measures um, being introduced um, that would um, enhance um, 
the, the land gate features within the site. That, did that answer your question? Um, in part, sorry for my voice. Um, are we able to condition the size of the trees? Because I think that that's been an issue when people say we're planting new trees and they're adorable baby trees. So are we able to condition how established they are? Um, yes, we can uh, conduct them. Um, at the site, you know, there's been lots of examples shown in um, the... Excuse me. Yeah, then yeah, we can we can condition um, the the she replacement. Um, we have input a condition to make sure that all hard and soft landscaping um, detailed are submitted by the confederation. Councillor Matisquayo. Uh, thank you, convener. This is maybe a a, que a newbie question. I'm really sorry, but I I, I couldn't find. It's about the contribution. So I see, let me see which page is it, 23. Uh, there are, whoops. There's an, uh, a contribution towards transport, education, but on the healthcare, it says the site does not lie within the healthcare contribution zone. I just wanted the clarification, thank you. Yeah, so the, um, your supplementary guidance on developer contributions sets out the areas where we can seek contributions and there's specific zones for healthcare contributions and this area doesn't lie within one where there's a contribution sought. Are we still looking at... Um, yeah, okay, so I will, I will move on. So, Councillor Douglish. Questions have already been um, asked. Thanks, convener. Okay, I will ask a question. I, I see you, Councillor Gardner. I'll come back to you in a sec. Um, I also wanted to ask a question about contributions because I note, obviously, under education that um, there has been, a, obviously, a, a request, obviously, for secondary brought in, but not floras. And I just wondered whether we could just explore that a little bit further as to why. If you just bear with, I'm um, multitasking on three things. If you just bear, I'm going to get the consultations made public because they're setting as sensitive and that will help with the debate on education. So if you just bear with me in two seconds. Just to, just to say, I have actually finally managed to open the zip. If you if you click on download for the zip, and then open the the downloads folder within your browser, it will then highlight in there. Perhaps I got got there in the end. Apologies. The zip file should be public now. If you go in, the zip file should be there. It would have been made sensitive. Right, so education question. So consultation response on page 12 of the zip file, I'm hoping, um, we have the full consultation response from education. Um, and within that, you will see that education set out um, discussion in terms of roles, expected uplift in pupil population, um, taking into consideration pupil generation rates, which were approved by committee in April 2023. And that is the basis for the um, seeking contributions. Um, the education have sought a cumulative um, contribution towards Flora Stevenson's in terms of 
also including city plan housing sites. Um, however, they do note within their consultation response that on the basis of the, the application, there is currently spare capacity at Flora Stevenson Primary School to accommodate the estimated number of pupils that would be expected to be generated from the development proposed if considered in isolation. So as planning officers, we have considered, and the Chief Planning Officer has considered, the current capacity at Flora Stevenson is identified as being available for this development to come forward. And therefore, it would be unreasonable to seek contributions from this development, taking into account anticipated sites coming forward within city plan. And that is the, the conclusion that we have drawn. If committee think otherwise and agree that education's approach is the correct approach, then there would be a contribution of approximately £2 million um, towards education contributions for primary infrastructure. And that's based on a flatted development of um, £10,054 per flat. There is a contribution for secondary infrastructure, um, which is, was previously identified as being required within this area, and that's on the basis of £4,914 per flat, and that gives you just short of a million pounds for secondary school infrastructure. I would say it's an unusual one in that we've got um, city plan sites being brought in and used to um, provide the, the full picture in terms of what may happen for education um, contributions, but on the basis of um, our guidance and how we apply what's necessary to make this development happen, education have advised that, um, and there's, that there is current capacity within Flora Stevens, and we have taken that as the position as now. Okay, um, are we anywhere yet with heights, or shall we move on? Then we can do heights. Oh, heights, we're moving on to heights. Um, if you just bear with, there's a lot of bearing with Elaine today, but yeah, um, I will share a drawing on heights. My computer is not having a nice day today, I'm sorry. Yeah, move to the next, sorry, convener, move to the next question. My computer's just lost the drawing. Councillor Gardner. Yeah, um, thank you, convener. <clears throat> I was going to um, ask a different question, but I'll come to that later. It's just on the education one. Um, obviously, to two million can make a big difference. Is there an opportunity to, to go? You, you said it's an opportunity to, to follow the education officer advice. Um, could the applicant then claw back if um, the other developments don't materialise? Is that is that an option? Because obviously, if we don't go for it, we can never get it. Kind of thing. Um, so hope you understand the question. Thank you. Yeah, there's. Um, we have put. A con we have suggested a condition of a year, so that if in the other sort of scenario that they don't um, develop the site and city plan sites do come forward they are allocated that any changes to this scheme would then be reconsidered, reconsidering education. So if there was that, that change, almost the opposite of what you're saying, that if we then needed it and nothing had happened, then um, the condition limits development to starting within a year. Any legal agreement always has a clawback in it if the funds are not used for that purpose. So, um, But I think in terms of the education clawback within the legal agreements, I think it sits at about... 30 years and that's all to do with the funding process and how it's worked out so it is a significant time period that the developer would would have that uncertainty if we were to seek that additional money equally if you were to seek the additional money there would always be the opportunity for the developer to come back under a section 75a um, application where they could seek to amend the terms of the section 75 and say that the position had changed and they, they wouldn't be providing the, the money. Um, um, and they could also um, sign, there would be an appeal right as well within there as well. Sorry, Lynn, coming back on that, could you just point to which condition it is?
also condition one of the consents says the development to which this permission relates must be begun no later than the expiration of one year beginning on the date of this permission. It would usually be three years would be your default. Um, and then above, within the conclusion paragraph, um, we're required under section 58, one part B of the Act, just to, to express that within the report, and we have done that, that we've a, a direction that it's only one year they've got in which to commence development. So then to be clear, that's not actually just to do with education, that's, the, that's a general. That that's, the, that's the whole development must start within one year. Okay, are we, we we're back to heights? So question was asked about um, AOD heights. So this is the section running um, north, um, north to south across the, the heights. You see the stories there. So the AOD sits at 61 at the, the main height there, and then you've got your recess section, and it sits up to 65.8. Um, and then this is the section down to Kimmer Game. Now, we don't quite have the, we don't have the same AOD information available um, for Kimmer Game, um, um, and then it stretches up to that point there, so that's your west elevation. Um, then your east elevation goes up to 65.86, and your heights, um, my computer's frozen. It's one of those days, I'm afraid. Now, I believe Councillor Matt, you started on this, and then Councillor Bill wants to ask about this as well. So, did you want to follow up on this, Councillor Matt? No, that's the information we have, and we don't have the AOD for King of Game, so we don't have it. You know, that's it. So, I'll hand over to Councillor Bill. Councillor Bill. So, we don't know how high, how much higher in terms of metres the new development is compared to the previous one. We don't have that information. Is that correct? Thanks. Just clarificate that between the existing building and the new building, or between the existing the new build and the adjacent residential. Well, firstly, between the existing building and the new build. Yes. Um, I do have the AOD for the existing building. Um, so AOD for the existing building, you can see the heights there. If we zoom in, it's very small when you get very small measurements on plans, but it goes up to um, 58.14 um, on that drawing in terms of the heights of the, the office, 54.87, and, and then it drops down at 50.55. Um, the Village Hotel, goes up to 59.81 um, existing, and there might actually be um, east and west drawings. I might get the existing height of Kimmer Games. No, they haven't carried the drawing through, but that's the sort of the east-west. Um, so Kimmer Game Place, it goes to 54.9 at that point at the moment, and it's going up towards 64, so it's a 10, approximately 10 metre increase on that. that um, Elevation, but as Laura pointed out, there's a 20 meter distance between the the new build and the existing properties. Thanks, Councillor Jones. Thank you, convener. My question: I'm struggling to, uh, to to get an overall feel of the heights of these buildings and proposed development in the. Um, in the context of the, the broader landscape. So have we got any 
view uh, any drawings or pictures just to show the broader landscape and the impact um, of, of these very high buildings, please. I, I thank you very much indeed for your patience, Councillor Gardner and Councillor Minister Minikin. We're just drawing up those and I will be coming to you to next. So um, there's... Right, um, Councillor Jones gives you an idea of the, the hotel next door and then the, the flats at Kimmer Game and the height that, and, and the large blocks that are within that location. Then obviously the open park um, yep. to the west. That's helpful, thank you. Right, I think we're moving on to secondary questions. So I'll go, um, Councillor Cameron, you're the only person who hasn't asked a question yet. If you, no, don't wish to. Okay, we will go, oh sorry, and sorry, and Councillor Burgess. Sorry, Councillor Burgess. No? Okay. So it will go Councillor Gardner, Councillor Manish Manikin, uh, Councillor Booth, Councillor Beale, Councillor Mowat. Yeah, thanks again, convener. So uh, my question is, <coughs> excuse me, about the link between uh, Kimber Game and the development of the potential link. I'm very pleased to see there's one from the hotel site. Um, you mentioned that the, that the the applicant had looked at potential links uh, to the housing site to the south and this one. Could you give a wee bit of detail about that, please? Like showing the plan and any background, and I might have a follow up on on, on that basis. Thank you, Katrina. Okay, that is where um, the antiquated blank um, is shown as a potential um, future measurement to enhance uh, connectivity. It's only antiquated at this stage, though, as you can see, it doesn't actually show detailed of um, the, 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 uh, the detailing. Um, but at the moment of time, it's also quite unclear whether it can be delivered at mentioned it to do with land ownership um, and or do the proposed Dutch picture um, but it there just to indicate how measured and the picture could be enhanced. Did you have a follow up? Yes, um, that, that's very helpful um, and I appreciate um, that the land to the south belongs to somebody else so it might be difficult to happen. I'm wondering if we can condition that the, the bit within the development is delivered as part of this application, which makes it uh, more likely that the other part bit could eventually be delivered. Whereas if it's not um, delivered it, it within the development, I think it would be far less likely. So I'm wondering if that can be conditioned. Um, we have a condition um, under condition five that um, all the hard and soft landscaping um, will be submitted uh, for further consideration. Do um, the, any future path will come under that condition? So we get more details with that mm -hmm. condition. Uh, I wonder if specifically we can add that this. Okay. We, we can amend the condition to include details of that path. Yes. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. I'm sure we will be discussing conditions at some point. Uh, Councillor McNeish McNeekin, followed by Councillor Booth. Thank you. Thanks, Kavira. 
Um, I, I see that CIFA hasn't um, objected. However, um, the proposal states surface water is to be discharged via roof and ground networks prior to discharge into the wider Scottish water surface. Sorry, this is page 77 in my documents. Um, my question is, obviously the soft landscaping proposed will be rain permeable, but what about the materials in the hard standing? Because I couldn't find that. Because we know a lot of the flooding that we've had, the, the issue is that the, uh, the volume of water and the speed that it's going into the systems. So anything that can be slowing that down and percolating through will help reduce that risk. So it is, are you able to tell us anything about the materials that are proposed to be used in all of the hard standing areas that can add to that mitigation of flood risk? The um, block A to E will all have a stadium roof finish and block F will have a green blue roof finish which are materials that help to slow down um, stuff as we know. Um, and also the inclusion of the, the stud pond to the east and the further stud pond to um, the south of the site it, um, it, it will help to attenuate um, water within the site. Um, in terms of um, the, the landscaping um, condition, again, that's something that would be considered um, as part of the condition that further details would be provided to ensure that the um, sufficient drainage within the site. Um, so I guess what I was really looking for is, are they, is it using the, the rain permeable asphalt and, and paving? Because if so, I, I'm I'm afraid I've missed that. All right. We we don't have details of the exact materials of the roadways in. I think what's important is the flow and control of water as well to the suds ponds to the areas that capture it and um, control where the water goes. But as part of the conditions in terms of the landscaping details, all the hard surface details would be coming in for us to have that um, considered as well. Councillor Booth. Thanks, Kamina. My question is about the principle of demolition, and I wonder if you could go into that in a wee bit more detail. In particular, I note the report says there is neither a realistic nor viable scope to repurpose and retrofit the existing building for a multi-occupation, and this is a relevant material consideration. I note that the... Um, Embodied Carbon and Circular Economy Summary, which was submitted alongside the application, um, comes to the conclusion that retaining the existing building and converting to residential with its current layout would not meet um, CEC policy standards for amenity, daylight and aspect, etc. So my question there is, which policies does it breach? Because... Retrofits are not required to meet DES 5, are they? That only applies to new buildings. So which policies are in breach there? That's part of the question. And I have further questions associated with the, with the demolition principle, but perhaps they, I should come back to them later. Um, with regard to referring to policy, it's not the plan and framework policy nine, where um, the policy support development proposal that will result in the sustainable reuse of brownfield land, including vacant land and, build, and building with demolition regarded as the least preferred option. Yeah, um, I think what you've read out is the the applicant's conclusion in terms of whether any new build development, um, any repurposing of the existing office would comply with our policies. We haven't seen a scheme um, in terms of any repurposing of that building, so it's very difficult to, for us to make an assessment on it. I think when you look at the aerial, it's a very deep plan office, so there would be substantial alterations that would be required to that office we would be looking at daylighting of those premises. We would be looking at amenity of the, the quality of spaces that are then created within those for, for properties. We would still apply 
you know, the, the size guidance, daylighting guidance, all those sorts of things into the, the properties. Um, yet, I mean, DES 5 says, Permission, applying permission will be granted for development where it is demonstrated that, and it's the qualifying a text under underneath that applies to all new development. It would be a new development of a type because you would need to substantially alter that office building to make it um, acceptable for residential purposes for, for our assessment. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to pursue that specific issue. The other issue in relation to the, the principle of, of demolition is that in, in their assessment of you know, comparing retention of the existing building uh, with the proposed development in terms of the carbon footprint, they note that retention of the existing building has a marginal carbon saving compared to um, the, the proposed development. However, they conclude that that is offset by the need to provide an additional... I think it's, was it 91, um, uh, 95 units off-site. And I just wonder why the assessment assumes an off-site provision of the additional 95, because there is quite a lot of car parking space within the existing site. So why was that not used as the comparison, if that makes sense? I'm not sure if we've got an answer for I mean, that's an assumption that they've made in terms of the development. I think what we look at is the development of a whole and the whole piece that comes forward. And I think the embodied carbon one is always a, a debate and discussion that retaining your existing building will always have that embodied carbon. And then it's obviously you're not losing it. But what are we gaining from, from the new development in terms of the provision of homes, the improved thermal performance of your building? So there's... Is it, I'm very keen that we don't just have a figures calculation within our reports in terms of carbon because it's a very, yeah, it's, it's, it's a more nuanced, balanced discussion, I think, about embodied carbon that we've got. Is it a final, very quick follow-up, Councillor Booth? It is an aside, and I wonder whether we should Can put we this on our park? training. Put this on our training agenda. I mean, I agree with your statement, um, uh, Elaine, that we shouldn't just be looking at figures, but I think it would be, it would be helpful to explore in Council more detail Booth, uh, how we're we can comply with We're in questions. We're in questions at the moment. So nine. can we just, we, we could discuss that at a later point, but I'd be grateful because it's already 11 o'clock if we could just stick to questions at the moment. Okay. I've now lost my track. If it, oh, I think it's Councillor Mowat next, followed by Councillor Beale. Oh, no. Okay. Councillor Beale. Thanks, Amelia. Yep. So I just wanted to go off a slightly different track. This is the, um, I'm assuming it's not that clear from the report. This is, just want to clarify, this is currently an employment site. So obviously this can be conversion to housing. So therefore it's got to meet um, policy EMP 9. So I just wonder if you could just kind of just clarify that a little bit because we have not mentioned about prejudicing nearby employment or how much the new site might employ. Um, so I just want to, kind of get some justification for that. Thanks, Kavina. Okay, um, the report does uh, address an uh, employment plan um, where it said that the criteria to redevelop employment site or premises in the urban area for uses other than business industry or sorry. So um, this document has provided background context of um, the existing situation of the building being currently vacant for over five years. Um, and... Um, MP, employment plan, one of the criteria is that, um, um, is that if the site is larger than one hectare, the proposal should include floor space designed to provide for a range of business users, which in the case the proposal 
Et på podium for at komme af og det er gravet for. Det er question. Um, I mean, partly I can see that from the report, but really just wondering what we think the level of employment is going to be, because obviously it means no other employment can take place on the sites of what a thousand square meters of business space, but that could be anything, couldn't it? Yes, so the, the business the business space, we've got class 1A, 3, 4 um, coming forward, so it'll be, it's a range of business uses that might come within those spaces and it's flexible to allow once the, the, the buildings got consent, them being marketed, it could be a range of different business uses. So you could have retail, you could have class three um, cafes and things that will support the, the building, it will support 20 minute um, neighborhoods and living, but also class four business. So your smaller little businesses, offices that, that might pop up as well. So it's a different type of business that would be going in, but we still have um, a range of um, employment type uses within there, although it's not the, the pure employment use that would be being lost from the from the development. I suppose just two quick points of clarification. This is a windfall site, and was economic development obviously consulted on this? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, they were consulted, but they didn't provide a consultation response. Okay, committee. Is there further questions from committee? Councillor Jones. Just to, again, I want absolute clarification on the education aspect of this. And if, if I might just ask with regards to the statement, it should be noted that a new site for an annex... Oh, beg your pardon, I'm in the wrong text. Hang on. Yes, whilst it is accepted that the delivery of education infrastructure should consider the cumulative impact of proposals. This case is a unique example as the contribution requirements are reliant on the adoption of specific sites. Can you just clarify that? Why is it unique? Sorry, can you just clarify the question again? I'm asking why is this unique in terms of the education contribution? Um, I've said it's unique in terms of education contribution because it is a windfall site. Um, we hadn't previously identified a uh, pressure for Flora Stevenson in our developer contributions and supplementary guidance. And you will see that table two within the education response very specifically identifies four sites that are allocated within city plan and projected outfalls for those sites. And you will see that the output that's been generated by this site is 28 pupils whereas the total pupil generation that education have identified is 191 pupils. And the 191 pupils are unknown at the moment because we don't know what the allocation will be, we don't know what mix of units will come forward. Um, so that is part of the, the uniqueness of this consultation response. Um, we have taken cumulative con uh, contributions before where we have known sites coming forward and we have known actions that are required for specific education um, establishments that we have set out in our supplementary guidance, and we don't have that in this case. It would be for the action programme of city plan coming forward that would be identifying um, the education requirements from city plan, as within all actions that would come out of city plan. Um, I think it does state within the consultation response that there is a capacity at the moment for Flora Stevenson's to take um, on the site. And it, what we haven't mentioned in the education one is that it does need a new annex if we were to adopt the, the requirements that education have set out. Um, and it does say that there is no land identified for an annex. So the contribution rate is for the school only. It doesn't cover the land contribution as well. And that's a complete unknown. And we don't have a figure in front of us for the land contribution either. So quite often you will get a contribution, um, an education consultation in front of you that will state an infrastructure and a land contribution separately. Whereas in this case, we've only got the infrastructure. We, the, the land question is unknown because there is no land identified that al would allow for the annex to be delivered as well. 
Uh, I've got a question. Um, the trees, obviously, on the southern boundary, it states in the documentation, obviously, they're, they're, they're the one, but they're category three trees and they're of poor health. It also states that they were put in, obviously, as a shield of protection for the Kimberley, which is next door. But there's a justification for removing them. So I just wanted to have a full understanding of why those trees have not been assessed, you know, in, in ways of continuing as a barrier, considering of the height difference. Well, in considering whether to retain the tree, you need to consider the, the, the lifespan of the tree to the tree um, because of the existing situation. Um, they are not in great condition um, in terms of like the significant overshadowing um, from the seed. Um, so, when considering the Catherine species um, with a limited lifespan, that's where the case for the seed to be removed come, um, and also to achieve a more um, better integration between the residential development to the south and the development where it would allow for a more biodiverse landscaping scheme to be implemented in between. Um, I have Councillor Garner, Councillor Mowat. Was that a hand, Councillor Booth? Yes, and then Councillor Beale. Yeah, uh, thank you, Convener. It's back to the education thing. Um, Elaine, does city plan not um, designate land on, on the sort of Fetis police campus for an extension of Flora Stevenson's? And therefore, can we not uh, calculate the land value hypothetically for, for that acquisition? Because a lot of the uh, development, uh, I think, it is linked to city plans. So therefore, if we're taking that into account, we should be able to take the land value of, of the Fetis acquisition into account, perhaps. I think, I think the word hypothetical is the is the word that I would just focus in on and that we don't know what the outcome would be from city plan. Um, the calculations, I there is no site as far as, nothing's come forward in the consultation response that there is a, a site for an annex for Flora Stevens. So I wouldn't want to second guess what that might would be. We don't have that information in front of us when we've considered it. So we can't do a land value calculation. Education have said that there is no site identified for an annex to Flora Stevens, and that's the best that we can do in terms of what we've got the application. We have considered, I think, I'll, my geography might let me down, H32, I think, in Table 2 is the potentially the FETI's site um, within city plan. Um, so the numbers there that would potentially come out of city plan have been considered in that table too. So that deals with the infrastructure and the size, but it doesn't deal with the, the site and the land. And I, I would, we don't have any figures in front of us. So if that was, if, if your question, Councillor Gardner, sorry, is what would be the land value that we could guess that, or we could seek, not guess is the wrong word, what we would seek for it, we don't have any figures, we don't have any information in front of us on that at all. So I'd like to come back on, on that and, and you've made your, your point clearly, so maybe it's a bit moot, but nonetheless, we're counting the housing there. You, you identified 61 for H32 and also the Royal Victoria as well as so a, a city plan site, so we're counting the numbers of units. So therefore, if we're making that assumption, it's not um, unreasonable to actually take the other bit of city plan which identifies the site for the annex on the rest of of uh, or another part of the, the, the FETI site um, and you know any surveyor can give you an approximate land value to take into account uh, uh, so I'm not sure why education officers are not uh, pursuing that that part of it um, but it's maybe for them and not for you but it, it does seem strange to take the numbers on one hand for the houses but not to take into account the other part of what city plan says for that site. Yeah I I wouldn't, but as, as planning authority, we don't have control over obviously where the education estate's going in terms of the land values, what deals might be done for purchase, etc. of sites. We can only go on the the information that education um, authority provides us with. Okay, uh, Councillor Matt. Thank you. Earlier, I was just saying that Councillor Beale was before me. Not that I didn't have a question. Uh, but like you, 
Never mind. Uh, my question was about the trees, because obviously removing the trees on that northern boundary of the Kingaham site or the southern boundary of this site is going to make quite a significant difference. So I noticed that uh, in the report it says everything conforms, um, but we've only got a 20 metre difference, uh, a 20 metre distance, which sounds a lot, but actually when it comes flat to flat isn't huge um, so it, it's it's really about the amenity going forward both of the impact on the new site the old site and this site um, and how those windows line up what the um, overlooking and the difference is going to be the impact on existing buildings and actually, the impact on these buildings, because, of course, the Kingham site, it's a northern boundary, it's the southern boundary of this. So there, sorry, there will be... Um, do, are we content that everything on the southern boundary of this site um, is not impacted by the existing buildings? And to aid Laura, would you just be able to just clarify just the questioning is, yeah, she's just following on the text and sometimes the Sorry. question gets a yeah, bit lost. Yeah. The, 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 the question is, we've assessed impact on what happens when you take the trees on King, the, the existing buildings. What's the impact of the existing buildings on the southern boundary of the new buildings on this site which I because I, I noticed they're only 28 it, it's 20 meters is the distance given in the report <clears throat> well at, at the report covered all oh, the trees are within um, the boundary of the application that and they were planted at the time to provide a separation between the office and the residential. Um, but the application in Burford is for a residential um, development, which is also compatible with the residential development um, to the south. Um, now, the tree themselves are within the application boundary. They sit on a high retaining wall. Um, and, you know, considering that what it would be in 10 years' time, the the chief themselves could, will um, be in poor health. So when you take that into consideration as to whether the trees could be retained um, within the current proposal, um, on balance it would be um, counterproductive when in fact there could be a better landscaping scheme um, introduced. Um, but because the trees are already there, there is established in, um, enjoyment for the resident for um, the south. But we have to take into a balance consideration that the trees themselves catch the sea in 10 years' time. Um, what, would, what would the outcome be compared to what's in front of us? So, the report of Hamilton does acknowledge that there would be a change to private levels it currently enjoyed, but they're at a 20 metre privacy distance. And going by the Edinburgh um, design guidance, it said that the, the development pattern of an area will help to defend the privacy distance. It's very different in this area the fact that, you know, the site is um, an office building um, and it's come forward for residential. So, in considering like, what would be the most appropriate privacy distance um, for this particular site, um, it considered that while there would be a change over time, the, the impact would not be so adverse. Um, I wonder if it would be helpful if we just have a look. I think part of your question there was, what is the, the sort of the elevational detail along Kimmer Game and the elevational detail along the southern boundary of the Ferry Road um, sites? So, um, yeah. Um, our friend Google. So this is from the 
the easternmost part of Kimmer Game. So we've got the park um, to your rear. So this is the the, the tree boundary that is provided um, along there in the fences. And I think Laura's right. When the trees were put in, you've got a, an office development there. There's a different relationship between residential and commercial business use and residential to residential. You'll see that there are flats that clearly will have windows that outlook towards there, but we've done the assessment of the 20 metres, the daylighting outlook and privacy. There will be um, properties that there, there are some areas that are um, flats that stick out. There's obviously some stair course that go up. Um, there's some gaps between um, the buildings there, and then some of them are slightly less sort of secondary um, main elevations and then second windows to bedrooms or, or so I would assume going down there and then um, that takes you to the end where this potential link um, comes through and you can see the end on parking um, that relationship there and there was also another slide that I was just going to bring up in terms of the I have to stop sharing and share again this one here, um, if I can just get it to zoom in a bit, this just shows the relationship that it's not, uh, the new development isn't a continual wall um, of development that's going in. So you do have gaps in between and areas of relief between the buildings um, there. So there's your, your building line um, and your buildings and, and the flat sitting on the corner with the, the terraces on the edges and not on the ends. And that gives you a relationship between the two. Can I, can I just come back? Did you say the terrace is on the edges, so there aren't a row of balconies on that southern boundary? I'll just bring up a drawing and just double check. An elevation for that section for you. Um, just to clarify, the balcony on the southern edge of block A, B and C, the deduction is actually taken from the end, um, not, not from the um, start the projecting, from the projecting balcony to um, the residential development, and that's where the approximately 20 metres distance. It would be greater, right up again, but we've taken a measurement from the projecting balcony from there. Yeah, I'm going to, there are, the balconies do that, Brian, so if you just bear with me a second, I'll just bring up that slide. While we're looking for the slide, can I check Councillor Booth and Beale? Are you going down the same line or is it something completely different? Is there anybody else that would want to ask questions about this while we've got the slides up? Okay, going, going on. It's giving me the wrong thing. Got my email. So yeah, that's your elevational detail um, there on those corners. So there are balconies that come round the wrap at those points. It's got main windows and then smaller windows in between. Then you have your gap and then you move along. Okay, Councillor Mowat. Okay, so Councillor Booth. Thanks, Convener. Um, I know that Environmental Protection have objected to the application and recommend it be refused. Um, and I wonder if you could just go into some of the issues that they raise in their submission, in particular um, noise, smell, and car parking. I know they don't object on car parking, but they did say um, that it's a highly accessible site from the point of view of public transport and that they engaged earlier on with the uh, applicant to encourage them to come forward with a zero uh, parking application. So they're disappointed at the significant level of parking. But just in terms of the smell and the noise, uh, as far as I understand it from the report and the presentation, uh, the, the, the argument is that these can be addressed through a sort of closed window approach, which environmental protection don't support. So I wonder if you could just go into a little bit more detail on that, 
how many properties are affected and whereabouts in the development are they, please? So oh, um, the report of handling um, carbon um, environmental protection can stand on page 15. Um, so obviously environmental protection don't support um, closed window as a form of mitigation again to um, noise, from, noise from the neighbouring hotel like um, uh, where there might be an event going on and, and also the, the cooking coming from um, the hotel just itself. Um, so, in considering whether the, the impact would be so adverse, we were able to um, understand how many of the units would be a closed window assessment out of the whole unit. So, um, for the habitable windows, um, the report panelling said that 10% of habitable rooms will require closed window ventilation for immediate noise, and that is a small minority. And then, And also for the um, the cooking order, um, order of assessment was carried out, and um, the report said that there would be eight units on the west side of the poor development on um, the fifth and sixth floor that may be affected by order from um, the village hotel kitchen or so. Um, those units are between um, 27 to 30 metres uh, north east east of the shore. So um, the report of handling concluded that you know only eight of the units, but makes up three percent of the overall uh, unit numbers, and that's just more minority. Um, closed closed window um, method is something that we've adapted for um, in an urban situation um, for development across the city. So in that case, we might take into account of the number of units that would be affected overall. It was considered acceptable. I wonder if it's possible to highlight on a plan where the units are that are affected by the... Because as far as I understand it, there's, there's more units that are affected by the closed window approach to noise than there are for odour. So I wonder if it's just possible to highlight where those units are? Is it all of the ones on the west side of the site, next to the hotel? Well, I don't have the um, individual floor plan um, up on the presentation, but the floor plan shows um, the... So for the odour, it's at the upper floors on the fifth and sixth. So it's not the um, ground floor levels, it's the upper levels because of the height of the hotel and that the buildings are higher. So the exhaust from the cooking is at hotel roof level, but we've got new development. So it's along this um, western edge then for the odour. Um, if you just bear with me for noise.
And then it's a, sim it's a similar situation. It's the Western elevation as it relates to the hotel in terms of noise output um, within those, those areas. Fini, Councillor Booth? Yes? Okay. Thanks, sorry. Right. Yes, I was just... Okay, then I've got Councillor Bill, Councillor Douglish, and Councillor Cameron. I'm aware that it's now coming up to 11.30. So if we could, if anybody else has questions after that, could we think about them quite quickly and be quite prompt about our questions? So, um, Councillor Bill. No, sorry, De Councillor Bill. Thanks, Rina. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Bill. Um, just want to, to follow up the EMP policy again, just in terms of, of 9A, which is in terms of um, not prejudice any uh, nearby employment uses. I just wonder if in the consultations you had any reply from the nearby employers, I know there's at least two kind of fairly large employers near to the site. Have you had, did you have any response from them, either objecting or um, affirming it? Thanks. Hi, um, the, the um, comment from the Bellish Hotel or um, the Moriton Supermarket from across from the site. Mm -hmm. the, there hasn't been any formal responses from the neighbouring sites. Councillor Douglas. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I was just going to go back and ask a question that Councillor Booth touched on in terms of environmental protection or um, support on closed windows and ventilations as a form of mitigation. I wanted to ask, is there, was there or is there any other form of mitigation that was considered for this application or is this very much the, the only potential solution to some of those problems? I think in terms of the, the older one, when you look at it, it's the upper floors that are impacted on. So you would then be looking at doing mitigation measures to the hotel. And then is that an increased flu height? Is it increased? I think it's a, it could happen. It's not that there's current odour issues there. There's not current um, complaints raised, but you're obviously adding in residential um, premises adjacent, so it raises the possibility of there being complaints. So if you were looking at the older one, it's an increased flu height or alterations to the cooking equipment potentially on the hotel, um, there'd be limited that you could do in terms of the building. And I think with the noise as well, it's the upper floors again, and it's the escape of noise. I mean, you would normally put acoustic barriers or buns down between your two different um, uses but by the time you get to the upper floors then it's more limited what you can actually achieve at the upper floor levels and that you know if, it, if we're looking at two stories it might be acoustic planting or something that you would put in thank you okay i have councillor cameron councillor gardner and then it's going to be me and then unless anything else i'm calling it quits thank you um convener i just wanted to ask in in terms of the fact that the development lies on a or adjacent to a traffic sensitive street and this could affect the method and time of, of construction. What are the implications of that? Because uh, obviously I know there's road occupation permits, but we've seen with other developments that these can be extended. So is that, a, is that something that we can not condition, but if it's approved? Yeah, or what does that mean, you know, traffic sensitive street? I, th I think it probably traffic sensitive street just means it's terms of flow and volume of traffic that potentially comes in there and is very close to that big roundabout um, and network there. Um, it would be for the developer to engage with the roads authority in terms of any closures, any um, traffic lights, control of vehicles and etc. that they would need to do. So they would need to engage with the Roads Authority um, as part of that. We wouldn't get involved in the movement of traffic on the public highway in relation to construction. It would be very difficult to condition. It would be very, yeah. you know, that any enforcement would then fall with the Roads Authority and um, the enforcement wouldn't fall through the Planning Authority. Okay, the reason for my question is I'm just keen to avoid, I'm thinking of a particular project near Mullen Ward which is, is, has been extended and extended and extended in a near a, a complex junction so 
thank you for clarifying that there's nothing we can do as a planning authority around that. It sits with the... OK, thank you, convener. Catherine Garner. Yes, it's uh, a convener, thanks. It's about a condition to do with the education. Um, Elaine, we discussed previously, or I questioned about the um, the uh, annex site could, as part of the condition, if we were going to go down the um, um, the, the bit of the report, the consultation from the education department, could we ask them to put in a figure um, as part of the condition that they give them the chance to come up with a figure for the site value, given that it is a city plan site for that annex and the, uh, the uh, numeric assumptions are to do with city plan. It seems to me reasonable that, 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 that if that's for seeking contribution on that basis, then we should be seeking a contribution for the site as well. Um, and if they don't come with a number, then that that that's it. But I think they sh should be given the chance as part of the condition to do that. I is that reasonable? Um, we couldn't do a condition and we couldn't do an informative. It would need to be very specific amount of money that was then set out that would then be encapsulated within the Section 75 agreement. So if it was something that you were looking to seek to secure as part of this application, we would require education to go away and do those works and then report back to committee with the contribution figure because it may well f fall out with any um, delegated powers that the chief planning officer has. So we would have to continue it to get that number? Is that what you're, you're, you're saying? If we were going yeah. To yeah, if you were seeking to go down that route, then um, you would need to do a continuation to seek clarification on the developer contributions. I will come to you in a second, Councillor Booth. I have a question first. Going back to the trees, a lot of people's favourite subject. Having looked at the tree report, et cetera, it says 90% of the trees are category B. So I do find it slightly strange that the entire southern route is all category C. I just want to double check that is correct. Um, can I clarify that the developer looked at the um, tree protection plan for... Reading the, the tree report, it says 90% of the trees on site are category B. And in our report, it says that the southern boundary is all category C. It, it just seems slightly strange if 90% of all the trees on the site are category B, that the entire southern boundary, because it's quite a long boundary, is all category C. And I just want to double check that's correct. Well, I'll just, I'm just going to share an image convener just so you can see the other boundary of the site. So the western boundary of the application site is substantially wooded as well. So there is a lot of trees down that, that elevation and that, um, that drawing. And then we've also got in the tree protection plan, it does identify um, the significant number of trees and it does identify the, the southern boundary as, as Group C. So we can confirm that, that that is correct then, the entire southern boundary is. It's, uh, the reason I'm asking is obviously the tree report that was submitted by the applicant states that 90% of the trees are category B. Yeah, no, um, I think when you look at page 28 of the 
um, the tree report, it does cover, there's quite a lot of category B trees then listed. There's a substantial number there. Um, there with C. No, the, but there should be a plan that shows them all mapped as well. Um, so yeah, group one is there and then um, it's, it's potentially how they've done it in terms of a grouping. Um, there may be sometimes when there's category C, the groupings can um, not individually identify each tree if there's a, identified as a group rather than an individual tree. Um, and that's probably what the, the discrepancy is that you've highlighted. So then just to clarify, there might be group Bs, there might be group Bs within that grouping then? Um, I wouldn't like to provide a definitive comment on that without looking right through the tree report. Councillor Booth. I think that the image that was shown previously for the trees on the southern site are that they're all compressors. Um, so that would seem to tally with the suggestion that they're all category C, but I mean, what do I know? Um, my question... Was that your question? <laughs> my question was to follow up from Councillor Gardner's question. If committee were mi minded to continue the application to allow that further information from education, can you just clarify what the timetables are for potential appeal on the grounds of non-determination? The application was validated um, 11th of August, so we have four months to determine it because it's a major application, which August, September, or November, 11th of December, so they're within their three-month appeal window for non-determination at the moment. There is no extension of time in place. So they would have up until middle of March in which to appeal non-determination. And I think following on from that, I think education possibly wouldn't be able to come up with the, the figures within one round of committee. Okay, are there any further questions from committee? If there are not any further questions from committee, unusually, I'm going to suggest that we have a break because we've actually been sitting for quite a long period of time. So the time now presently is 11.42. Is eight minutes sufficient or do we need longer than eight minutes? Longer than eight minutes, okay. So, okay, I will allow then 13 minutes and you can come back at 5 2. So that's 5 to 12. Thank you.
Okay, we're just about to restart. I can see Councillor Gardner online. Can we just check that we also have Councillor McNeese Meekin? Hi, and <laughs> Councillor Burgess. Thanks. <laughs> Good, everybody. Cool. Welcome back, everybody. Now, okay, we have finished questions to officers. I say that in a hopeful way. <laughs> yes, okay, so we'll be moving on to discussion. Who would like to open up discussion? Well, um, in light of the reticence here, um, I would like to say that I think there are, we need housing, and this is a lot of it. Um, to quote yourself, um, Councillor Osler, we should not make perfect the enemy of good. Um, and I, sorry? So, um, on that basis, I, 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 would, I would myself like to see um, education's advice taken up, that there's a contribution to, uh, to um, the education budget. Um, there are a lot of unknowns with regard to the education numbers and other things, so I think we should make provision for that just in case. Um, so on that basis, on balance, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation to approve, to grant permission. Councillor Smith Square. I believe Councillor Gardner was before me. All right, you, Councillor Gardner then. Um, th thank you, um, and th thanks for, for that as well, um, Marta. Um, yes, uh, I, I, I th I'm thinking that we that, that I would be voting to, to approve this development uh, today as well. Um, provides um, much needed housing and also um, affordable housing um, in in good numbers, um, including a good reasonable mix of units with some larger units as well, which is very welcome. So good landscaping provision in the middle of the development, like high quality, not um, surrounded by car parking or, or, or roads or anything like that. So um, th that that's well handled. I mean, I'm aware there's a base basement car park. If we're going to have car parking, that's probably the best place for it. So the 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 land itself is maximised for the the residents' benefit. Um, Councillor Booth raised an interesting question about uh, reuse and embodied carbon. I'd be ha happy to discuss that um, convener at um, uh, planning committee or something like that at, at, at some stage. I think it would be difficult to reuse this site for, for housing, um, whether it could be adapted for modern office would be another question, but that's not the applica application we've got today, but it is an important question nonetheless. And if the, if the uh, to, to um, wrap up my contribution convener, um, if the, um, the, the condition can be amended to include uh, in the landscaping and roads condition, condition um, providing for that link um, in the drawings and, and then thereafter in, in the proposal, that, that would be uh, very good. Um, I'm wondering about the co continuation and, and, and Councillor um, Booth hit, hit on that in terms of the timeline. I think uh, I would take up Councillor Jones that we should take the education department's guidance here. Um, I'm wondering whether whether um, uh, we don't go for the continuation today because we could lose that um, at appeal. Having said that, they may appeal anyway um, if we, we um, add the education department's recommendation uh, to, to, to the capacity there. So it's, it's a tricky one. Um, 
Uh, there must be reasons why the education department didn't include it, but I, I think it's it was something I, I would be looking for where we're not under the, the, the pressure of the potential appeal. Um, so um, that, that's where I am, convener. Th thank you. Councillor Musgrave would like to go now. Thank you, but actually, Councillor Gard did say a lot of what I was going to say, so maybe I should have taken advantage of the situation. So I do welcome um, the, the, the good mix of the, um, the affordable housing and the housing proposed, so I agree with my colleague on this. And I also bring uh, on board what Councillor was saying about education. Um, so I will be supporting this. Officer's recommendation. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Cameron, Councillor Beale, Councillor Mowick, Councillor Douglas. Please remember the order you're in. Thank you, Convener. No, I'm supporting of this application. I think wind site, windfall sites are always welcome. Um, and I do hope that all the necessary legal agreements can be achieved within the six months because that matters hugely. It's not just a case of gaining the consent by us as committee. They don't have consent unless all those things are tied up. And I'm concerned uh, that sometimes that takes longer than six months, and it, it's not a good it's not a good thing, given that this is bringing much needed housing, and also it still includes um, business and employment use uh, on the site. So I'll be supporting today. Councillor Beale. Thanks, Fabiana. Well, I mean, what, what's good about this application is obviously we've said the number of, of um, homes, the number of affordable affordable of that. Um, a few businesses at the bottom, well, that's good. So I can think it's quite happy it meets employment uh, policy nine. However, I just think it's too high. And I think it's, um, you know, 10 metres higher than the surrounding area. It's kind of, and I just think that would be, that's why I'm very uncomfortable with this application for that reason. Um, under des for a heightened form, it just is out of kilter with the surrounding um, areas in, to my mind. But I might be in a minority there. So thanks, Camilla. Councillor Matt. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, actually, quite an interesting site, this. Yes, it's a windfall site. Um, obviously, the, not only is the current um, building unsuitable for splitting up into uh, multiple units and sort of refurbishing to reflect the changes in the office market, I think actually the location of this for offices is, um, has been, is just not attractive. For, for people so what we do have is quite an interesting site now I have wrestled with this actually quite a lot because the environmental um, the report from our environmental services about the impact on those no road noise uh, and tra traffic noise because this is let's not forget cited on I mean I don't know what map councillor Gardner was looking at but this isn't not surrounded by roads it's on ferry road it's one of the busiest roads in the city um, so it is bounded on one side by a very busy road at a very busy um, junction and, and, and roundabout. However, I am, mind, I am reminded um, that there is obviously a significant amount of housing along Ferry Road, so I don't think it would be reasonable to say that something that could be set back further than a lot of the existing houses, plus have triple glazed windows, um, we should refuse on, on those grounds because essentially we're condemning large lots of housing and saying that, um, which have got less suitable glazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've examined in detail about the impact on existing premises, and that's also part of that um, assessment, was, was thinking about the height. I mean, it's stand, you know, it, it is good design, really, to build on your higher, uh, higher at your, your sort of your arterial routes, because... Um, it gives you that sense of entrance into, into the city. And I think we've assessed this sufficiently to show that there isn't, although there will be an impact because a building will appear closer than there is a building now on the neighbours, the adverse impact about which we, set, uh, we examine our policies against, I don't think are not breached in this case. So I think, yes, it will be a big change, uh, but it's, it's a good use of a site to introduce increased housing. Um, in this area, so I am content with the application today. Councillor Gunnar, I'm assuming you have your hand up because Councillor Matt mentioned you. You're muted. 
Yes, thanks, Kadina. Just understanding orders, I'd like to clarify what I actually did say was there wasn't uh, um, much roads within this development. I didn't mention Ferry Road at all. I acknowledge Ferry Road's a major street, so it's within the development. There's a lot of green landscaping, which is positive. So I think uh, Councillor Marrick must have misheard me. Thank you. Uh, what is um, being said is, or what I was going to say has been said by many committee members, so I won't go into too much detail. I know time is pressing. Um, just to say I'm generally supportive of this application. I think it's quite an interesting development. Uh, housing, which is obviously much needed for our city, as we often see here at Development Management and other committees, um, obviously welcome the affordable uh, housing uh, provision on site and obviously it's very good in, in terms of from single individuals to big families moving in. I think it ticks all, ticks all the boxes there and um, meets its climbing up obligations. I understand that in, in big developments like this in relatively small areas it can maybe um, feel a bit uh, imposing for local residents but this is very much um, uh, uh, an example of what we'll be doing in terms of our planning policy and densely populated um, developments in relatively small areas. Um, you know, there's still have maybe some slight concerns about height and um, obviously it would be best if in terms of closed windows and ventilations if that wasn't needed, but it, it is and it doesn't look like there's any other potential options there, um, but that doesn't outweigh generally supportive comments. So I think I'll be supporting this application today. Thank you. Councillor Meads McNeigan. Thank you, convener. Um, I, I think I'm pretty much in line with most of my my colleagues. I uh, my concerns around um, flooding risk have uh, I think pretty much been addressed. And overall, um, it, it it in terms of placemaking, it seems to tick a lot of the boxes that we are looking to be ticked. Okay. If nobody else has anything to say, then I will conclude. I'll, oh, is that you coming in there, Councillor Booth? Yes. No. I can go first and you can come after me if you like. How about that? Um, there is a lot to commend this, and just to, to, as, to give a bit of history about the general area, the site next door, which is the Kim Kim, used to be the old Telford College. So, you know, there has been a history within the area of obviously a change of usage from, you know, business or other use into residential. So it's highly sort of, it, it is good, as we have said, you know, to have residential. Um, Having said that, though, I do have some concerns. I am in favour of the fact we have residential on the site because I think it's important. But to me, the impact is on the setting of the area. As Councillor Bill has already said, I think there's too much. I worry slightly about the overall impact. I worry also about comments from environmental as well. And I just think that there's a number of problems that need to be addressed because I'm slightly concerned that in our desire to produce something that is very, very good, we've kind of gilded the lily a bit too much and put a bit too much on it. So I know that was my new expression as opposed to making perfect the enemy of good, gilding the lily. So for me, I'm very supportive of the idea of the residential site. I am I'm very disappointed about the reduction of the trees. I accept the point that, you know, they might not be high standing, but they were put in as a barrier and they were put in for protection. And yes, there's a difference between business and there's a difference between residential. But when you've got a building going next door to it, that's even higher and going to have even more impact on the surrounding. To me, it seems to be nonsensical to remove the barrier. I'm also concerned about the, 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 the distance or lack of distance between the village hotel and residences on the other side of how close that is, the relationship between the two because of agent of change, et cetera, principle. So to me, I'm in support of a residential I'm just concerned the fact that this is too much residential squeezed into a site that the overall impact for the immunity is going to be too great. So for me, um, it's sort of DES 4, DES 5, and I would like to be able to say MVO 12 with the trees, but again, I'm not sure whether that, considering we don't know whether they're Bs or Cs, because I appreciate the fact that they've been in there for 10 years and they might have limited life, but my assumption would be like they have a majority of these places that you would have a management plan anyway, and at some stage, trees and other developments do go and things can be replaced. That's not a reason to remove them to begin with. I don't think that's justifiable to remove them to begin with. So that's where I'm going with this. Councillor Booth, did you want to come in? 
Thanks, Camilla. I'm great, grateful for you going first because you've helped to clarify some of my thoughts on this matter. Um, I, I think I'm in a similar position to you and Councillor Beale on this one. Um, I think there is an awful lot to welcome in this application. Um, it's high density. Um, it's highly accessible from the point of view of public transport. It delivers residential. I think colleagues have said it delivers residential in, in a windfall site. That's very, very welcome. There is affordable housing, genuine social rent in this application, which is rare these days. Um, and there are significant biodiversity um, gains through the application as well. But um, I still have concerns. Like you, convener, I have concerns about the trees. I am actually less concerned about the trees on the southern boundary of the site. Um, Capressus don't have much um, you know, value from a biodiversity perspective, but the ones on the north side of the street, of, of the site, along Ferry Road, I do have concerns about those, and many of those are much, are higher rated, you know, bees, uh, bee rated trees. And, and I'm not 100% convinced that we have seen an argument for their removal. Um, so I think the trees is a, is a strong reason to, to move against this. I have concerns about the embodied energy and about the demolition on a site that could potentially be used, but I accept that within the boundaries we have of NPF 4 policy 9, I think it is, um, I think we would struggle to make any argument stick at appeal on that basis, but I do think we need to explore that issue in more detail. I have real concerns about the education contribution, um, but I accept that the answers that have been, been given by officers to concerns raised by Councillor Gardner and others and Councillor Jones um, suggest that, that there is a limited amount that we could actually do as part of this application to, to secure that. Um, I, am also, I, I share concerns by other colleagues about that this application does not deliver pedestrian cycle permeability through the, the, the north-south axis. Um, I accept that we can't do anything about that because it's outside the, the ownership of this application, but it is one of my concerns. But fundamentally, the objection from environmental protection, I think we would be unwise to ignore that. The noise, the odour, um, and the car parking are all issues that have been highlighted by environmental protection as concerns. So I would agree with you, convener. Environment 12... Um, DES 4 and DES 5, um, and if you move or a colleague moves rejection, I will support that. Okay, we've um, gone through discussion. Um, Councillor Gunn, I'll let you, let you come in. I'm presuming you're wanting to add something to conditions or to informatives? Yeah, um, I, I'd like to um, move the officer's report with the two uh, things that, that I raised, education, taking the education officers recommendation uh, and making that a condition and also the the landscaping thing that uh sorry that, can, I, can, I, can i sorry because i haven't actually moved anything formal as we that i was just wondering whether there was something you wanted to ask at that point i was going to well, ask, i just wanted to double yeah. check that everybody else had spoken who needed to speak and then we will move formally okay has everybody else spoken who would like to contribute okay we'll be moving formally then Councillor Gardner. Yes, so um, in moving formally, I, I, I would like to um, include the education officer's recommendation for, for the financial contributions um, as opposed to the, what, what's in the actual report. Um, and, and I hope Elaine can help with, with tidying that up. And also um, that the drawings, as Elaine had uh, alluded to earlier, be amended to include the link to the uh, southward towards Kin Kinheim, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, estate, so that, that there is every likelihood that that can then be pro provided or a stronger likelihood that that can be provided. Um, uh, so we do all we can within this application, within the red line boundary, and then it's obviously up, up to others to to um, take that forward out with the site. But I think that's the, the, that, that's the best that we can get out of this. So uh, with those two, changes um uh, i um would be seeking um somebody to second me um con convener um i don't know if elaine wants to talk about the uh, the two um changes to the conditions that that, that i've suggested and uh, just to, so everyone can be aware of them um thank you 
So um, the amendments would be condition five of the um, report would be amended that it's notwithstanding the approved drawings, a fully detailed landscape plan, including details of all hard and soft surface and boundary treatments, shall be submitted and approved in writing by the planning authority before work is commenced on site. This shall include the landscaping proposals um, to deliver the link to the south of the development linking to Gimmer Game. And then in terms of the education contributions, um, it wouldn't be a condition that they would be attached. This would be an amendment to informative one um, that, and committee noting the recommendation that section 75 agreement be concluded in relation to primary school infrastructure contributions, which is set at a level of 10,054 pounds per flat for the delivery of primary school infrastructure um, with a total contribution therein of two million pounds, two million and seven hundred and forty-six pounds. That now, sounds good. Saw, Thank you. Now I saw a series of hands, but I saw Councillor Matasqueo first. Is that about seconding, Councillor? Happy to second, my colleague. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, I will be moving a different position. I will be moving rejection of this application with a heavy heart because, um, yeah, I, I do strongly believe and I do hope that we will come back for, um, in terms of residential because residential is much needed. Again, this is one of those scenarios where you really want to make sure that something is good. And what concerns me is there are too many slightly grey shaded areas on this one and there's just too much on it. So we've already discussed some of the problems with this site, so I will be moving rejection on DES 4A, DES 5A, and MVO 12. Looking for a seconder. <laughs> Councillor B. I'm happy to second you on that, convener, for all the reasons previously mentioned. Apologies, I wanted to also add MPF 14 as well. Councillor Marrett. Yeah, I'd like to move a third position, uh, which is to move approval of the site. I'm happy to accept the amendment to... Um, condition five, but I'm not happy to accept the inclusion of the education condition at this stage, because I think without that having been included in the name of the document that I can never actually remember, it is premature when we don't have MPF4 coming back. And I think the suggestion from officers to put a one-year um, planning, a one-year expiration of the permission is the more appropriate one, and that if this isn't begun within one year, then they can come back and seek that when we have the right things. Because my, cons my view at the moment is if you put that condition on asking for a £2 million planning contribution, which is what you're asking for, for a product of 32 students, they will appeal that and that permission, that will be taken out. Uh, so I think it would be better to be, to put in the one year permission uh, that is suggested and wait until we have got MPF4 back and we've actually done the contributions document that we'd be that we'd need to rely on to um, ask for those monies and you know I'm sorry if education can't produce their evidence when we we need it then I, I think we are we are hide bound that we, we are going to struggle to enforce those conditions so I shall move that I don't know if I have a second I'll second Councillor Mayotte's position Anyone who hasn't spoken so far would like to contribute? Sorry, I meant to clarify uh, my MPF 14, which, because um, we've got um, for, for refusal, N NVO 5A, sorry, 
sorry, ENVO 12, sorry, DES 5A, DES 4A, and NPF 14, because um, one of the, the, the tenets of, of that is, is a healthy place, and I feel that the, it's not improving physical and mental health within this area. There are conflicts there that I think we could be creating and we need to kind of work on. Okay, um, take us on to the vote then. So we do have three positions um, and we'll, we'll take them in the order in which they were moved. So we have motion by Councillor Gardner, seconded by Councillor matos Quayle, which is to grant planning permission subject to the conditions, reasons and informatives set out in the report and the legal agreement. Um, the amendment to condition five and uh, also to informative one, um, as, as explained by Elaine. The amendment one is moved by Councillor Osler, seconded by Councillor Booth, which is to refuse planning permission on the grounds that the application is contrary to LDP policies DES 4A, 5A, ENV 12 and MPF 4 policy 14. And amendment two is moved by Councillor Mowat, seconded by Councillor Cameron, which is to grant planning permission subject to conditions, reasons, informatives and the legal agreement as set out in the report. And the amendment to condition five, but not to informative one. So, could I take the votes firstly for, um, we'll do it in the order they were moved. So, firstly for the motion by Councillor Gardner, please. Thank you, that's four. And for the amendment by Councillor Osler. Thank you, and for the amendment by Councillor Mowat. Okay, we, um, have, we, we don't have um, an equal number of votes, so uh, 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 um, an overall majority, so um, we can move on to um, a second round of voting. So Amendment 1 falls, um, that had the lowest number of votes, and we will start the vote again, round 2. So um, we have the motion moved by Councillor Gardner, seconded by Councillor matos Quayle, um, to grant planning permission with the amendment to condition uh, five and informative one. And against that, amendment two, which was moved by Councillor Mowat, seconded by Councillor Cameron, which is to grant um, with the amendment to condition five. Could I take the votes for the amendment by Councillor Mowat, please? Thank you, and for the motion, please. Okay, we do have an equal number of votes um, and uh, the convener doesn't wish to use a casting vote, so we will take this by lot, if you bear with us for a moment. <laughs> Point of order, convener, sorry. Do, do standing orders allow yeah. the convener to abstain from their yes. casting vote? Yes. And if so, can you clarify which element of standing orders? Bear me a moment, Councillor.
yeah, standing order 24.5 um, allows for the, the, the Lord Provost or convener to use a casting vote. Um, if they decline to use the casting vote, then the decision is by lot. So we have we have two positions: um, motion by Councillor Gardner and the amendment by Councillor Mowat. Um, I should ask the movers of the motion um, uh, and the amendment if they would wish to pick which uh, <laughs> side of the coin. So I will just take whoever's uh, Councillor Mowat. You were first. So. I'll have tails, please. You'll have tails. Okay. Is it best? No, it's one. <laughs> it's one. One and done. I'll just have tails. Okay, so just for clarity, um, the amendment by Councillor Mowat is tails and the motion by Councillor Gardner is heads. It's heads, uh, so the motion is carried. Okay, thank you very much, Indy. We've still got, obviously, two more pieces of business to attend to.